Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds for March 2nd, 2023. Thank you for joining those of us joining in person. Those of you joining online on WebEx, please put your questions in the chat. Dr. Mazur will keep an eye on those questions and share them with uh, our speaker. Our speaker today is a very special uh, speaker. We're honored to have Dr. Eric Fliegler joining us from Boston Children's Hospital. Dr. Fliegler is a pediatric emergency physician and health services researcher at Boston Children's and an associate professor of pediatrics and emergency medicine at Harvard. He was a political science major, which actually plays a big role in his uh, advocacy work uh, at Brown University, a uh, political science major at Brown University, he received his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania and completed his pediatric residency in pediatric emergency medicine fellowships at Boston Children's. He has almost 20 years of experience leading large-scale research projects and conducting groundbreaking injury prevention research with a focus on violence and firearm fatalities. He has also developed a couple of really innovative uh, technological applications. One is called Help Steps, which is a web and mobile-based system for helping families connect with social services, uh, which is the backbone referral system now for the Boston Public Health Commission. He also founded Trivox Health, a web and mobile system used to manage thousands of patients with chronic diseases, including ADHD, asthma, autism, depression, anxiety, epilepsy, and other conditions. Trivox Health is now used in 10 different clinics at Boston Children's and a growing number of other institutions. He is the recipient of over two dozen grants, has published more than 100 articles in the original peer-reviewed literature on a very wide spectrum of topics. I was looking at this in PubMed, everything from tobacco cessation to kidney stones to febrile neonates to Zofran for, for gastroenteritis. But really, his major expertise is as an international expert in pediatric sedation, food security, and gun violence, which is what he'll talk to us about today. Uh, his injury work is focused on evaluating the role of legislation in reducing firearm fatalities and understanding the epidemiology of firearm violence. Uh, I see that he's going to tell us about his first book, which was published two years ago, so I won't steal that thunder. The underlying current, though, that really connects all of his diverse work, from sedation to injury prevention, is a theme of reducing health disparities across racial and ethnic groups and across socioeconomic status. His analytical skills and his ability to leverage big data for good for really the elusive social good are virtually unmatched in pediatric emergency medicine. We're lucky to have Dr. Fliegler here for a few days at Seattle Children's as a visiting professor, sharing his wisdom with us during several sessions. I would especially encourage the residents to make sure to come out to noon conference today and tomorrow for some one-on-one -on -one time with him uh, as he helps focus on those issues some more. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Fliegler. Thank you all so much for having me. Uh, you can tell from uh, Indy's description to my emergency medicine colleagues here, uh, classic uh, ADHD type of uh, individual <laughs> <coughs> who chose emergency medicine. Um, it, it's really a pleasure to be here and to be talking with you, and thank you all for who are joining via the web. Uh, I just want to say up front, this is a challenging topic we're going to talk about today, uh, and, and it's worth acknowledging. Uh, you know, there's a lot of numbers. We're going to talk about kind of firearms from multiple perspectives. But at the end of the day, we're talking about kids and adults and their lives and people being shot and the disparities that are associated with this. And it's a hard topic, and, and, and we should just kind of keep that in mind. And I just want to acknowledge that I am going to be talking, just so we're all aware, uh, very specifically about homicide and suicide. And, and these are just tough areas. Um, Indy alluded to the fact uh, that uh, I had the pleasure with uh, Lo my colleague Lois Lee of uh, publishing a book. So that's my disclosure. We all look for to have a disclosure one day. And so I finally uh, got mine. I want to start just with the major takeaway points. Um, firearms are now the leading cause of death uh, among US youth. And I'm going to kind of dive into really what does that actually mean and how should we think about that. There are enormous disparities, disparities that are, that are from my perspective, are kind of mind boggling and worth uh, remembering. Uh, and then finally, uh, and this is the most important part, uh, talking to this audience, we have a role. We have a role in reducing these fatalities. And we should be thinking about you know, how do we actually uh, move this forward. So with that said, uh, here's the learning objectives. We want to talk about the epidemiology. I want to analyze it, think about what does this data actually mean. We'll talk about areas of advocacy very broadly. Uh, Indy alluded to the fact we'll talk a lot about legislation, but we'll talk about other forms of advocacy as well. And then we'll talk about like what's the role of doctors in this? How do we talk with families? How should we be thinking about this uh, important topic? So this is a graph I put together. And in this graph, every single person in the United States who died is represented. So in one year, this is 2019, everybody who died is here. Um, on the x-axis is how old they were when they died. 
On the y-axis is the percent that, based on the various colors I'll show you in a moment, of, that, of the total fatalities. So when you look at the green, that's your non-communicable diseases. That's, of course, your cancer, your heart attacks, things like that. And not surprisingly, these happen as people get older. That's, that's where that's dominant. Blue is a little bit of a hodgepodge, communicable diseases, maternal-related stuff, neonatal. And the neonatal, of course, drives why it's so prominent uh, in the younger years. And then yellow are injuries. So just kind of look at that for a moment and just think about what an incredible source of uh, morbidity and mortality injuries are in the United States. As a matter of fact, when you look at kind of you know, the age groups, it's worth starting to think about it as pediatric folks down around age 15, but even up to age 34. Over half of the fatalities that occur in our country are from injuries. Why am I bringing this up? We should know why people are dying if we're going to think about what are the interventions we want to do to reduce this. So this is a general free framework. So this is that same data, except now I'm exclusively looking at firearms. So again, x-axis is how old they were when they died. Y-axis is the percent of total deaths that these deaths represent uh, for any given age group. And then you have the light green on top, which represents the homicides, homicides by firearms. Underneath that, that slightly darker green is self-harm or suicide by firearms, and then the unintentional deaths. And just take a moment and look at these percentiles, especially in the age groups we deal with. And you can see here in the 15 to 19 year olds, 23% of 15 to 19 year olds who die in the United States die by a gun. It's a pretty amazing number if you think about that. When we look across you know, all the deaths in the United States, about a little over 1% of all deaths in the US are from guns. But in the kids that we deal with, the 15 to 24 year olds, one in five deaths are by a firearm. And specifically for males, it's 28% of the 15 to 19 year olds. The major reason to keep this particular number in mind for a moment is that if you talk about firearms with various people, you're often gonna hear the argument, this is not the domain of doctors. This is not even the domain of public health. We should be ignoring this data. And I'm gonna put out, I think, the argument that most of us would agree with. If this is where a huge percentage of the kids that we deal with are dying, how could it not be our job to think about this data? So that's kind of a framework to kind of just put it right up front. So this is an article um, that I published just this past November. Um, and what I was trying to accomplish in this article was a way of how do you even visualize, how do you think about all the people that are dying from guns? And what we decided to do, we, were, we, look, we went back to 1990, so we've got uh, 31 years worth of data, and we looked at all the people who died and how to kind of put together these heat maps. But what I want to focus on is that number in the upper left-hand corner. It's 1,110,421 deaths. That is all the people who died over the 31-year period by guns in our country. That is more people who have died from our country going back to its founding in all of the wars we've ever fought, including the Civil War. That is essentially the number of people who have died from COVID. Now, COVID, obviously, a much quicker time frame that this all happened in. But think about the money, the resources, the efforts our country and the world has put in to fight this pandemic because of the severity of it. And yet, when it comes to guns, we really have put in virtually nothing relative to that. The numbers have been changing pretty dramatically over the last decade. When I started doing this research, roughly 30,000 people died every single year from guns. It's a pretty large number. But what was really interesting is for a decade, it was totally stable. I mean, it would vary by 100, 200 people a year, but it was 30,000. And then about eight, nine years ago, it started to rise. And when the 20, final 2021 data come out, that's what it's gonna be, 48,951 or so people who died from guns. That is a 20% increase in the last two years alone. So clearly we had a huge problem and now it's gone off a cliff. It has just really just taken off. In regards to kids, uh, my colleague Lois uh, Lee uh, just published this in the New England Journal. Guns, as I, you know, I talked about before, they're the leading cause of death. It used to be motor vehicle crashes, but it was around 2017 that we crossed over and you can just see this number just keeps going up. Specifically looking at kids, um, I want to just kind of graph it over time so you can get a sense of what's going on with homicides, suicides, and unintentional deaths. Uh, kids are a little bit different in terms of their fatalities than adults. With younger adults, uh, homicides are the leading cause of death from guns, and it's roughly about 60%. By the time you get into the adult world, it actually totally flips, and it's predominantly suicides are the leading cause of death when it comes to uh, uh, the guns. What you can see is from the Nader, so going back of, um, to 2014 with uh, the firearm homicides and going all the way back to 2007 with firearm suicides, we've had a 75% increase over this time frame. So that's kind of what's been going on over the last decade or two. 
I mentioned up front, the disparities are pretty, um, pretty horrible. And so if you look at this graph, this is looking specifically at male firearm homicides. But in all honesty, if I put up the female graph, the, the, the data is going to look like the same disparities. And if I looked at the suicides, the, who's dying is going to be a little bit different. But this one is where I really want to focus. You can see when it comes to black youth, the numbers are incredible. 140 per 100,000 is the peak of fatalities uh, for this particular group. And then you can see how it is for um, the next highest group is the American Indian Alaska Natives. Then you have uh, Hispanics and then whites down there. Compared to white young adult males, black males are killed by guns at 24 times the rate. Now, I just want you to think about the disparities work that you read about, think about all the time. When we talk about disparities, we're often talking about a disparity of 20%, 50%. If you talk about something happening to one group versus another where it's a twofold difference, that's an enormous thing, and we say we have to do something about this. 24. I do not know of anything else in healthcare that even remotely comes close to this type of disparity. It's not just by race, um, it's also by poverty and the exposure and of course the environment that you live in. And so this is one of, one of our fellows, Jeff Barrett, did this paper a few years ago, uh, looking at what happens in terms of firearm fatalities at the county level when we look at poverty. And with each of these things, that, those numbers on the bottom represent the concentration of poverty, so how many people in a given county live, by, live, in that, uh, live below the poverty threshold. And as you can see, as you march across, as the poverty rate increases, it just keeps going up and up and up. So by the time you're living in areas where 20% or more of the population lives in poverty, you're talking about over a threefold difference from the areas where the least number of people live in poverty. Of course, a lot of this exposure is reflected in that data about race and ethnicity because we know if in America, if you are black or brown, the likelihood that you're gonna live in a high poverty concentration area is much, much higher than people who are white. As a matter of fact, in our country, just to kind of put in your head, uh, if you are black or brown in our country, 60% of the population lives in the highest poverty concentration areas, whereas, uh, whereas it comes to white families, it's about 8%. So kind of this incredible contrast, and that's why we see these differences. A lot of this has its roots, of course, in uh, the structural racism that has been predominant in our country going back to its founding and was exacerbated in the 1930s and 1940s with some of the redlining, which basically kind of forced and caused it. You know, when people think about ghettos and people think about the high poverty areas, we often wonder why do people live there? And this is really the result of many of the government policies, and we can see how it gets reflected in their health as well. So um, I have a colleague, Amanda Stewart. She's a great social thinker, and she likes to do what she calls social math. So how do you put in context? How do you think about these people who are dying? So when it comes to uh, youth in our country, about 10,000 people are gonna die, um, 10,000 kids are gonna die every single year in our country. That's a school, bull, school bus full of kids going off a cliff basically every three days. Every three days, it just those kids disappear, their lives are snuffed out. That's an incredible thing to think about. And, 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 and the reason I particularly think about this uh, way of, the, of it is that you hear about places, you know, you hear about some place in, you know, India or in South America where a bus literally goes off a cliff and what, you know, it gets world attention. Like people pay attention to this stuff and they say, how can this happen? And they think about how do we fix the roads and how do we make these differences? And that's why we don't hear about a lot of this happening, of course, in the United States. But again, it's a problem that we've somehow allowed to just skirt by in trying to think about this way is maybe a different way for us and to try to get people who need to work with us, legislators, et cetera, to think about this math. So I like to have these conversations be interactive and I'm gonna invite people to ask questions of me as I go along, but I'm gonna start by asking a question of you. There's roughly 330 million people in our country. How many guns do you think are in our country? What are some of the numbers people would say? 500 million, okay. Anybody else? A billion guns, any other thoughts? Somewhere between 500 million and a billion guns, probably a pretty decent way to think about it. At a minimum, there are probably 400 million guns. Tony, there may be a billion. We don't, a we, we, we don't, we don't actually know. Um, and part of the reason we don't know is that there have literally been laws that have prohibited us tracking this data. If I wanted to know how many cars there were in the United States, I could actually find this out to the single digit. I could find out who owns those cars. I could find out what shape they're in. I could find out where they are geographically in our country. When it comes to guns, we have really kind of prevented us from doing this. Why has that happened? Um, it's happened from a very successful gun lobby who has really kind of prevented tracking this type of data. I'm gonna talk a little bit later about some of the research that then led people to kind of rally against us understanding this type of data. Um, but yeah, there are at least one gun for every person in our country, which is a remarkable number, and, and there's no place in the world that really compares to this. 
course, these guns are not distributed the same throughout our country. Uh, I'm in Ma from Massachusetts. We estimate the gun rates probably around 10% or so. There are parts of the out here um, where it's 60%. Washington is estimated. Anybody want to guess? You can see the colors, but anybody want to guess what the estimates for Washington are? About 27 to 30%. Very brilliant, brilliant. You, you, you must have had excellent training early on. I can, I can tell that. Um, and so, uh, so this is how they are. And of course, each state is not monolithic into itself. Rural areas tend to have the highest gun concentrations, um, uh, urban areas less. The type of household, whether you're black or white or Hispanic is different. There are differences e even by you know, how you vote. We know that in the, our country, uh, from Pew studies, uh, that the Republican population in our country, the gun ownership rate is probably around 65%. People who tend to vote Democrat, it's around 30%. Why would I even think about a number like this? Um, is it speaks to the challenge of these conversations. These are really, really hard talks to have with people. If anybody's ever tried to have a conversation with uh, about guns, it's it's very similar to kind of like an abortion type of conversation. People who are strongly pro-life and people who are strongly pro-choice, those are difficult conversations. Um, and. Uh, that we need to be able to bridge this better. I will say I come from a family where my dad had guns, but my mom was not happy about this, and so they were really hidden away in my house. I couldn't even tell you where they were when I was growing up. I knew they were present. My cousin, my uncle, they're all gun owners. Um, my uncle, who's a person, he's like one of those kind of classy people, has over 100 guns in his home. But he's willing to have conversations with me. My cousin, who's been my best friend my whole life and who I lived with for the first two years of residency, is a libertarian. And just me bringing up guns, he won't talk to me for six months. So like, you know, you have to figure out how to have these conversations better, and it can be very challenging. All right, so that's some of the epidemiology. Uh, again, I'm happy to talk more about the numbers. There's a lot of data out there. Uh, but now I want to talk about, well, what about the advocacy? How do we do something different? So about 10 years ago, um, my colleagues and I, we'd started doing a lot of research related to how does legislation affect X? And we had done three studies. We had looked at legislation related to booster seats. We had looked at legislation related to bicycle helmets. And we looked at legislation related to primary seat belt laws. Um, with each of these studies, we basically found the same thing, that when these laws were enacted, within a year or so, you saw fatalities specifically related to that go down. And they went down on average 15 to 20% in each of these states. These are relatively straightforward type of studies to do because it's usually a single law that you're looking at. And you can kind of really see the before and after. And you, you, know, you compare it to all the other states and you look at different time frames, lots of ways to do this. And they're really neat stuff to do. And so we had just written our third paper and just gotten it published when the trial related to Trevon Martin occurred. And so just as a reminder for those who don't, may not remember, this is the young gentleman who was killed in Florida. He was basically stalked in his community. He was shot by this gentleman and he was killed. And in the trial, this gentleman, uh, who I don't like to use his name, um, basically claimed the stand your ground laws, which we'll talk more about later, and was eventually acquitted of his death. And so I looked at my colleagues and I said, what's known about firearm fatalities? Do we know, uh, and, and firearm legislation, does firearm legislation make a difference? Amongst us, we didn't have any idea. We had no idea about this. Um, a quick look in the literature said it was pretty limited at how much research had been done. And so I said, well, you know, the Brady Center has this data about the firearm laws around the country. We know how to get the data about fatalities. Why don't we take a look? And so that was the question we asked. Does firearm legislation affect firearm-related fatalities? One of my colleagues who was in the room looked at me, uh, Bill Meehan, and he said, hey, Eric, what if the data goes the opposite direction of what you're expecting? Are you going to publish this? And I said, yes, we don't know what this is, and we need to understand this so we can make a difference. I wanted to take an honest look at it. And so this was the first paper that we started to do in this area of work. And so let me kind of orient you. So on the x-axis is what we call our legislative strength score. This was a very dumbed down way of looking at laws. Basically, we had a list of laws from the Brady Center. And we said, if you have a single law, you get a single point, and you just add them up. They just kind of add them up. It doesn't say what type of laws are the important ones. Nobody knew which th they were. And so that's our x-axis. And on the y-axis was the fatality rate. And each of those dots, of course, is a state. And we ran our regression. And this is what we saw, is that as you, as you had more laws, it seemed like the, the uh, fatality rates were coming down. Uh, you can see Washington is right there kind of in the middle. And when you ran the full regression and we controlled for everything, it turns out when we divided the states into quartiles, states with the fewest laws versus states with the most laws, that there was a 42% overall reduction in firearm-related fatalities. And what was very interesting for me is that was essentially the same for homicides and suicides. So something about the legislative milieu of what was going on 
look like it was related to, this is an ecologic study, this is not like a study where I could say we did this and then this happened and then to kind of follow a chain, you're looking at a set of laws and a set of fatalities. Um, but it looked like that there was a relationship between these. So that was our first study looking at this. This new number up there I'm showing, this, so this data was 20, the original data was 20, uh, 2007 to 2010. This, uh, so in Washington at that point, it was nine fatalities per 100,000. Since then, the 2021 data uh, is now up to 11.2 per 100,000, uh, whereas Massachusetts has basically stayed the same. Of course, firearm laws are a lot more complicated than that. And so this is a different database. This is a database called the statefirearmlaws.org database put together by uh, Mike Siegel, who's now at uh, BU. And uh, basically what they did was they went through and looked at every single law in the minutia. Um, some states, Massachusetts and California, over 100 different laws. Now this right here speaks to the complexity of the subject matter. When you're talking about 100 different laws and the way things can be written and so nuanced, you know, what, this is not booster seat laws. This is not, oh, is there a booster seat law or not? This is really makes it much more challenging. But the database lets us kind of study this over time. And this is kind of what it looks like. So Washington, by the way, it, as of 2020, had 43 different types of laws. Um, Idaho, you can see, has basically no firearm legislation. There's national laws, but no state laws. So now the question becomes, besides looking at them in aggregate, are there any particular laws that seem to make a difference? And so I'm gonna go through some of the background of these. But before we do that, I wanna just pause. And, and, and again, this is a worthless talk if we don't think about the actual people who died. And so I just wanna kinda call out a few names. So on the left, we have Zia DeShields, four years old, Shaquille Corngay, two, Holston Cole, three, Keon Shelton, two. And if you look at that title, one week in April, four toddlers shot and killed themselves. What does that title make you think? Like, I'm curious, in the audience, what do you think when you see that particular title? Anybody? Why are they holding a gun? Why are they holding a gun? How does a two, three, or four-year-old get a hold of a gun? That is an excellent question to ask. Anybody else? If yeah. So, so we'll talk, we'll, so the question, you know, the, the thought was, um, you're more likely to hurt somebody you know than a stranger, and we'll come back to that, absolutely. When I look at this, I think to myself, if I were to replace shot with anything else, what would the response be? If, two, if a four, two, three, and four-year-olds drove a car and hurt themselves or somebody else, what would our response be? When it comes to safety related to hair dryers, not a big part of my life, but I understand other people use them. Um, <laughs> the injury rate that is considered acceptable with hair dryers is one in 10 million uses. One in 10 million uses. And if it rises above that, then it gets people's attention. But when it comes to guns, that's not the case. So one of the questions that my group asked was, um, what about child access prevention laws? These are laws specifically written at the state level that say how guns have to be stored to prevent kids from getting access to them. Kind of pretty straightforward from there. I had a, a good fortune working with uh, Human Azad, who at the time was a third year medical student out in Chicago. And this is what we looked at. So child access prevention laws, let me paint the landscape. 25 states, so half our country, has no laws at all that talk about how guns have to be stored if they're in the home, in particular with kids there. Nine states have what are called recklessness laws. A recklessness law says, if I, the gun owner, take my gun, hand it to a child, that child then hurts somebody with that gun, I could be held liable. I have to, I think, honestly, I think it's amazing you have to write a law to say I would have to be held liable for that. But that's, that's one level, recklessness laws. After that are what are known as negligence laws. A negligence law speaks to the fact I didn't give my gun to the child, but somehow they got access to it or could have gotten access to it. So at the minimal level, the child gets access to it. So that's the child who takes my gun, they use it, they hurt somebody, I could be held responsible. The next level is they access it. That's the child, and you read about this in the newspaper all the time, who brings a gun to school. Doesn't hurt anybody, doesn't do anything, but they've actually brought it out of my home and now somebody's seen it, I could be held liable. And then a few states, Massachusetts being one of them, have a negligence child could access. In other words, if I store a gun in my house in a way that a child could get access to it, that is illegal and I could be held liable. Does that make sense? So this is kind of the spectrum of laws that are out there. And when we looked at the data, this is what we ultimately found. When you look at the states that have a negligence law, 
Compared to the states that have either recklessness or no laws at all, there's actually a 14% reduction in firearm fatalities. And very importantly, this is controlling for how many guns are owned at the household level. Now, as I said before, we don't have exact data about it. These all come from estimates, but they're pretty good estimates about essentially any given state what their gun ownership rate is. And so controlling for all those things, the negligence laws seem to really make an effect. The recklessness laws, states that have recklessness laws versus states who have no laws, there is absolutely no difference in their, in their um, fatality rates. But that's how it there is. And when you look at the more stringent states, so the states that go all the way to saying the child could access it, the firearm reduction is actually about 50%. And this holds for homicides, suicides, and unintentional death. So it's a pretty uniform thing. And I think this is, from my perspective, real data. When it comes to domestic violence, um, over half of women who are killed by guns, it occurs from an intimate partner type of violence. And when we look at states that have um, laws that restrict gun ownership, if somebody has a domestic violence restraining order against them, we see that overall there's a 14% lower rate of firearm homicide and almost a 10% overall of any type of homicides. This is one of the laws that's being challenged right now with all the, the Supreme Court is really kind of throwing all firearm laws kind of like uh, up in the air and we're gonna see how it's gonna shake out in the next few years. It turned out you know, at, at the national level, we're trying to do more in terms of uh, domestic violence, but we may be going in the opposite direction. But this is a place where I think uh, firearm laws make a difference. You've probably heard of the extreme risk protective orders, also known as red flag laws. These are the types of laws that allow usually a loved one, a family member, to say, I'm concerned about somebody who owns a gun. I'm either concerned from the perspective of suicide or from homicide and wanting to hurt others, and they have to actually go and file, and they can have the gun removed from that individual. The process of doing it, um, it's not simple. You first have to kind of basically make a complaint to the, uh, typically to the police. The police on your behalf file something. It goes in front of a judge. In that immediate period of three days, the gun is taken away temporarily, and then an actual trial occurs to decide whether the person is at risk to themselves or others. The guns are always taken away on a temporary basis, either six months to a year, depending on the state you're in. Um, they're relatively new. Um, I mean, they've been going, they, some states have had them for longer, but to the best of our understanding, they probably do make a reduction, certainly a reduction when it comes to suicides. Um, in Connecticut, which is probably the best study, for every 10 to 20 of these warrants, they think it decreases suicides by, by once, about a five to 10% uh, safety margin there. Uh, Connecticut was 14%, Indiana study 8%. There's some data that's gonna come out of California that they believe are actually showing reductions in mass shootings when people have been talking about these, having the guns removed. Of course, it's always very hard to estimate what did not occur, of course, that's the whole framework of these, but this is an important part that's moving forward as well. It's very challenging, people think that doctors should be able to file them, and you can see that in a couple of places that occurs. It is a challenge because if you do file it as a doctor and you're in a state that allows you to, eventually you're gonna have to go to court and you're gonna spend basically half a day there saying why you think this needs to become, uh, this gun needs to be removed. And so the challenges of how to do this, people are still working it out, but this is another area to think about. Now, not all legislation is necessarily gonna reduce firearm fatalities, and I, allude, and I talked about in the beginning about these stand your ground laws. I just wanna kind of frame stand your ground laws for a moment. So there's something that is known as the Castle Doctrine. The Castle Doctrine is a doctrine that says, in my own home, my castle, I can do anything I need to protect my family. And if you break into my house, I can kill you. That is literally what the castle doctrine is. It goes all the way back to the medieval era in England. That's where the castle doctrine comes from. The stand your ground laws take a very different perspective. So in the context of castle laws, the castle doctrine says if you're outside of your home, I'm not in my house, I'm outside of my home, I have to withdraw. If I feel I'm in a threatening area, I can't take proactive action, I need to get out of there. That's how our country is always run. The stand your ground laws flip it around. And they say, if you feel threatened out in the community, you can take the first step. You can shoot somebody. You can kill somebody if you feel threatened. Again, that's what happened with Trevon Martin. So we have a whole bunch of states that have passed these. Matter of fact, 23 states now have stand your ground laws. And so when we look at the data about what happens in those states, within a year, there's an 8% increase in firearm fatalities across our country in states that pass these laws. Alabama had a 33% increase, 30%, 33%. And when these go to trial, almost uniformly, the people who claim stand your ground laws get off, almost uniformly. If you are white in our country, you are highly likely to get it. If you are black in our country, it's a significant reduction in there. Again, kind of seeing how these systems work differently depending on who you are. So that's kind of the framework of that. 
It's challenging data. It's not perfect data. But this is the best that we understand this subject. OK, I've been talking about legislation. Let's talk for a moment about regulation. So when I told you about those four children, one of the things that comes to my mind is how is it possible that a kid can use a gun? How is it possible that a two-year-old can actually pull the trigger with enough strength to have it fire and hurt themselves or hurt somebody else? And part of the reason is right here. It turns out in our country, firearms are the only product that is sold that is not regulated for safety. Let's just say that again. A gun which is designed to cause injury and death is the only thing not regulated for safety in our entire country. And this goes right back to when the Consumer Product Protection Act was uh, filed in 1976. So can a gun be designed to be safer? What do you all think? Yeah. Of course they can be designed to be safer. As a matter of fact, biometrics, the ability for the gun to know, is this a authorized person to use it, which can be done in here with a fingerprint, they can be done with palm print, they can be done with RFID, so you wear like a little ring and the gun recognizes that you have that ring on and so it says yes, this is an authorized user. These have been in production for over 20 years, but they're not sold in the United States. They were put in production by the United States military request because people didn't want their soldiers' guns being taken from them on the field and used against them. They were developed by our largest gun dealers, by the Smiths and Wessons, by the Colts, etc. But the NRA took a very specific thought process which was they didn't want the slippery slope. Any regulations, anything at all to do with guns, they wanted to stop. And so they have totally successfully stopped any sale of these in the United States. New Jersey actually tried to mandate the sales very much along the lines of what California has done with uh, electric cars, where you have to kind of build up how many are sold. New Jersey tried the same thing. The one gun dealer that was willing to actually try to sell these guns was shut down by protests. And so these guns are available, but they are not used. Likewise. We have multiple organizations in our country that think about driving safety, car safety. And because we have all these organizations that are funded by the federal government, funded by the insurance uh, organization of our country, we have made cars so much safer. So in the 1950s, fa uh, fatalities from cars were quite high. What do you think the car industry said was the problem? Drivers. Drivers, absolutely. Drivers were the problem why people were dying. And so what was the solution? not just driver's license, make them better drivers. <laughs> Anybody got a teenager here or gone through this? OK. How successful are we at making people better drivers? <laughs> not really. It doesn't work. And so rather than trying to say the problem is the driver, we said, let's look at the environment. Let's understand what's going on. Uh, I won't go into details, but a very famous gentleman, uh, named, uh, Dr. Hayden, made the Hayden Matrix, we talked about we need to think about before, during, and after whenever an injury type of occurs, and how do we examine to make this? And so we did a lot of things. We made cars safer. Rather than the cars that were those you know, massive tanks that were you know, around, they said, make your bumpers crumple in, absorb energy. When you drive on the highway and you go to get off the highway, you've got all those yellow uh, buckets, those, those tall things. What's inside of them? Water. Why is there water? Well, it turns out when you used to get off the highway, there was a cement barrier. And if you hit that cement barrier going 50 miles an hour, you died. What do we do now? We have barrels of water which absorb the energy and dissipate it, and it does not like that. We have seatbelts. We have all these innovations that you all know about to make our cars safer. We could be doing the same thing with guns, but we don't put any regulations into this. So question for you all. Do you think having a gun makes it your household more or less safe? Please raise your hands if you think it's more safe. Please raise your hands if you think it makes it more dangerous. OK, so everybody said it uh, makes it more dangerous. Nobody said it makes it more safe. Guess what? Your peers in the world do not believe you. This is how we feel in the United States. Now, if you go back to the year 2000 and you look at that uh, dark blue line on top there, only about a third of our country in the year 2000 said it made our, car, our households more safe. And over half said it made it more dangerous having a firearm there. But by 2014, this had totally flipped. So in a 14-year period, over half, now we're close to two thirds of people saying that having a gun in your house makes it more safer, and only about a third saying it makes it more dangerous. This, to me, is one of the more classic definitions and signs that we as a public health people thinking about this have completely failed in our messaging in terms of the data and understanding it, and has been a complete success by organizations like the NRA saying, you know, guns are what make your house safer. Who here has heard the expression, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun? We've all heard this. That is a very successful propaganda from the NRA that has gone throughout our entire country. 
So what does the data show? Uh, before I even talk about the data, I just want to point out the second person there, Fred Rivara. You guys, I'm sure, all know Fred. Um, he was really one of the leading people looking at firearms in our country uh, right from the beginning. And so this is a study that was done here, Kings County. Um, and they, what they did is they looked over about a five-year period at all the fatalities that occurred related to guns in a person's home. And they literally went down to the morgue. They met with the, um, all the people involved in these. And they studied who was the person who died in that house, what was their relationship to the gun owners, et cetera. And so this is what they found. Nine were self-protection. Self-protection means that person broke into my home and I shot them. It turns out for of those nine, two of them were people that were intimate family members uh, who were breaking in, but nine people died. Twelve people were unintentional deaths, and they were mostly younger fatalities. Criminal homicide, 41 fatalities. Criminal homicide referred to somebody in that house who was a member of that household being killed or a friend being killed. So these were primarily women being killed by their husbands or boyfriends or spouses. Um, uh, and sometimes it was like two guys typically with alcohol, getting drunk, and one person being killed. And then suicide, 333. It turns out, even excluding suicide, the likelihood that a member of the household was killed, as opposed to that stranger breaking in, was 18-fold higher. 18-fold higher for the person dying that way. And this is how they added their discussion. People who keep guns in their homes appear to be at greater risk of homicide in the home than people who do not. Most of this risk is due to a substantially greater risk of homicide at the hands of a family member or intimate acquaintance. We did not find evidence of a protective effect of keeping a gun in the home, even in the small subgroup of cases that involve force entry. And so this was funded by research uh, from the federal government, and the NRA was pissed. And they went to a very pro-gun Congress, and they tried to actually eliminate the entire National Center for Injury Prevention at the CDC. They were not successful, but they did strip $2.6 million from their budget. Why do you think they stripped $2.6 million? That was the gun research, absolutely. So that was how much funding had been put into gun research that year. And so they were very successful in being very pointed about what they wanted to do. And this is something that was added on, it was called the Dickey Amendment, that read, none of the funds made available for injury prevention and control at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention may be used to advocate or promote gun control. Now research at the federal level or state level is not designed for advocacy, but of course research is used in the context of whatever it is you're trying to make a difference, whether it's about curing heart disease, cancer, etc. But this was a chilling effect, and it's because of the Dickey Amendment that basically all federal funding was eliminated for firearm research in our country. Representative Dickey later went on to say this was one of his biggest regrets. They eliminated uh, funding for firearm research that by the CDC lost basically 96% of its funding support. Um, it was eliminated, the NIH, uh, Health and Human Services, they all just disappeared. Background data started to be destroyed within 24 hours. So if you go to purchase a gun within 24 hours, not even the police can find out that you tried to purchase a gun, even that, that background check disappears. Even if you're a criminal and you're prevented from buying the gun, that data disappears in 90 days. So when they try to do that type of analysis, it doesn't exist. And most of the databases uh, were eliminated in our country. Fortunately, the good news is we started putting a little bit of funding in. So by 2020, we're up to $25 million. 2022, they allocated $60 million, although not all that came through. And so the funding is starting to come through. Relative to the number of fatalities, it's a drop in the bucket. It is a drop in the bucket. When it comes to pediatric firearm research compared to pediatric cancer research, so relative to the number of kids who die by cancer every year, which is about 3,000, there are about 6,000 kids of the same age up to age 18. So it's about a two-fold higher rate of firearm fatalities among kids. The, fi the funding rate currently is about a 500-fold difference, cancer versus firearms. So we have a long way to go. So we can advocate. And so that's part of where our role is. Um, there is firearm legislation that's popping up in states all across the country. And as I said before, some of this firearm legislation is going to work in the favor of trying to prevent fatalities, and a lot of it is going to work in the opposite direction with the stand your ground laws, with the uh, concealed carry, with no longer even requiring licensing for firearms in many, many states. So these are places where we can play a role. Fortunately, we actually had our first f federal firearm uh, legislation that was just passed this past summer, um, and it was called the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. It involves six different pieces of legislation, and just so you're all on uh, 
in the loop. Uh, background checks have been improved a little bit. By a little bit, it's for 18 to 20 year olds, uh, and it does kind of do a little bit more of a deeper dive, but it's not a significant one. Uh, domestic violence um, has significantly increased in terms of who these laws are supposed to restrict owning the guns. Um, the federal law has been very minimal. It's only if you are a husband and wife. Now they've expanded it to uh, anybody who you live with or an intimate partner. Um, again, what's going on with the uh, Supreme Court, we'll have to see if that stays around. The, ex the ERPO laws or the red flag laws, they're being expanded in terms of helping states get these going. Straw purchases, that's the person who tries to purchase a gun for somebody else who's not allowed. That's being made much more strict. Um, expanding uh, background checks, including places like the gun shows, uh, is an important step forward. And then a lot of money is being put into mental health. Mental health, we're ER doctors, many of us in this room, um, we know how severe the mental health problem is, and so I think it's really important. It's important not to conflate mental health problems with gun violence. Certainly suicides, close tie there, but it's not the same thing, but you know, this is where the funding is going. All right, does anybody have any questions about the advocacy before I move on to kind of like, what can we specifically be doing? So, we're gonna talk about suicide. It's a tough topic, but it's important for us to think about. So, on the x-axis are the different ways that people may try to kill themselves. You have firearms, poisoning and cutting, suffocation and hanging, other methods. And the percent is the percent of people who try to use one of these methods when they try to kill themselves. So, for firearms, when people try to kill themselves, about 5% of people will use a gun. Poisonings are the predominant one, 85%. So, with that data said, what do you think is the fatality rate if you use a gun versus if you try to overdose? Pretty high. Pretty, I don't want pretty high. I want numbers. <laughs> what, give me some numbers. Uh, tenfold. T uh, tenfold. So what's, what it, would it be for poisonings, would you say? <laughs> Somebody. Low. One percent? Anybody else? Five percent. So You're saying poisonings more than 20 percent? Okay. No, no. Oh, you're saying the ratio. Yeah. So what are you saying the firearm fatality rate is? 95. 95? Yeah. So 5 to 70, uh, to 5 to 50, something like that. This is what it is. If you try to use a gun when you try to die by suicide, you are almost universally going to succeed. 91%. Poisonings are 3%. Why is poisoning so low? Poison centers, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean That's by that? I know. Um, people get advice early, and there's also really good prevention laws. So there's and prevention, and you can get advice early. Okay, other thoughts? Maybe it takes longer, and like you have time to like turn back. Yeah, you have time to turn, all right, I want to, em let's emphasize this. Time to turn back. Clearly somebody with brilliant training. Um, <laughs> one of the, so it turns out, it's very hard to kill yourself with an overdose. Part of the reason is most pills won't kill you, right? Most pills will not kill you. Your body does a great job of saying, I don't want this in me, and you vomit and it comes out. Mm -hmm. Medical systems, including poison control, do a wonderful job of being able to help people. But if you were to put all of this in context, what I would say is you have an opportunity, you and your body, for regret. You have the opportunity to say, I've gone down the wrong path, to make a phone call, call poison control, send that text to a friend, and people can get involved and help you. When you use a firearm, there is no moment for regret. Once you have pulled the trigger, it's done. Matter of fact, you can't look at hospital data related to firearm fatalities because the majority of them will never be brought to a hospital. There's just no purpose. They are dead on the scene when somebody gets there. And so this is really, really important when we talk about what's known as lethal means restrictions. How do we change what happens when somebody reaches that nadir of their life when they've reached that worst moment, how do we change their ability to get through that moment? And a lot of it has to do with what is it that they use to try to kill themselves. It turns out for people who survive a suicide attempt, it is highly unlikely in the rest of their life they will die by a gun. By how highly unlikely? It's less than 10%. So if you can get them through that terrible moment, they have the opportunity to live and survive and actually thrive. But what they use when they're at that moment is gonna make the difference. And it's been getting worse for kids. It's actually been getting worse for adults as well, but I wanna focus on the kids. This is what's happening. We've talked about disparities before. And if you look at the 2010 data going to 2020, the numbers are just getting worse. They're getting worse and worse. 
And so these are the firearm suicide rates that are happening in our country. And the firearms suicides almost exclusively in kids occur because those are the guns that are available to them in their homes. So we have to kind of think about this framework when we think about what's our role in preventing this. If you identify from a community that has frequently been kind of abused and having challenges in the, from the past and today, you see that there are major differences when it comes to suicide. And in particular, it looking at uh, people who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, this is what the data looks like when you think about people seriously considering suicide. So right here on the left, you can see if you identify as LGB, 48%, nearly half of them, have thought about trying to kill themselves. Compared to in the black, this is the uh, group of students who identify as heterosexual, it's about 13%. And you'll see, made a suicide plan, attempted suicide, and even had to be hospitalized. The numbers are pretty grim. When you look at the Trevor Project, which tracks this data in the even more in depth, for people who identify as trans, it's even higher. So these are some of these I groups that we really need to think about helping them, helping them. So one of the questions that needs to be asked, what families are most likely to own guns? We've already talked about being in different states as a difference, but is there something different about the family in front of you? And it turns out, this is kind of from a race, racial and ethnic perspective, this is what's been going on in gun ownership over the last decade or so. So it turns out the white population in our country has been fairly stable for a decade and actually probably very stable for a few decades before that. Roughly a little under 50% of white households in America own a gun. Now again, if you're living in Massachusetts or you're living in Montana, probably very, very different. The black population in our country, the numbers have actually gone up dramatically. Same with the Hispanic population. 76% increase for the black households, 53% for Hispanic households. I think we're gonna see a lot of this reflected in that suicide data because access is just increasing. You can tell I like newspaper articles. Police, boy six, fatally shoots sister, five. Parents arrested. Jacob Grayson told investigators his six-year-old son removed one of two loaded handguns from a safe and shot his sister, police said. The parents told police their son had opened the safe before and Kimberly Grayson said she and her husband had taken the boy to a shooting range to teach him how to fire a handgun. So let's just kind of reflect upon this for a moment. This family recognizes that the safe that they're storing the gun in is not working. The child clearly knows how to access it. They know he's gotten access before. And the mentality that they had was we need to sh teach our child how to be safe with a gun. I have to say, I think it seems very reasonable if you're going to be a gun owner, you want your children to know how to shoot, that you want to teach them about safety. However, we know as pediatricians, developmentally, this does not actually work as well as people think. It actually doesn't work at all. And we can see that in how people store their guns, and we can see that in terms of risk perception. So let's talk about how they store their guns real quick. So when, this is a beautiful study that was done a couple of years ago. Um, and it looked at 30, they, they estimate there are roughly 30 million children who live in a house where there's at least one gun present. And about 15% of those households store the gun loaded and unlocked. That is typically in the drawer next to dad's side of the bed. And kids know where these guns are. 41% keep them either loaded and locked or unloaded and unlocked. And so these are what we call the least safe methods of storage. There is no such thing as safe storage in a household. Because just like in that other, um, in that newspaper article, kids know how to access these things. So we should not delude ourselves to think that there is a safe way, but there are safer ways to do this. And so when we look at data looking at actual firearm fatalities, and this is first looking at unintentional deaths, you can see if a gun is stored in the bottom right hand corner, unlocked and loaded, that gun in the dad's drawer, dresser typically, the likelihood of you dying in an unintentional, it's about 75% for the 10 to 14 year olds and 66% for the 15 to 19 year olds. So that, that's the least safe way to store those guns. When it comes to suicides, you'll see it's actually a little bit more spread. And this is a really important thing. There are people who think having your gun unloaded is safe enough. But the likelihood that the child both knows where the gun is and the ammunition and they want to cause harm to themselves, this number is real. And when we talk about guns being stored in the safest manner, unloaded, locked, ideally locked separate from the ammunition, you can still see that people are dying from that way. So it's something to keep in mind. When you talk to people about safety in guns, this is what parents say. 
So you have non-gun owning parents, 14% of them say they would trust their child with a loaded gun. Children as young as four. What? Yeah. Gun owners who keep their guns stored locked, uh, sorry, unloaded, locked, unlocked and loaded, excuse me, 35%. You don't trust them with knives, what you just said? Yeah, fork. Yeah. And when you ask parents, would your child act responsibly if they found a loaded gun? I mean, responsibly is defined as they wouldn't touch it, they'd leave the area, and they would tell an adult. 85% of people say, yes, they would. And this is true whether you're a gun owner or not. So uh, the truth is, it's not. <laughs> and, um, and we know that kids are really good at finding things. And so this is, and there are a lot of studies looking at that. With regards to what we can do, uh, in 2011, Florida actually passed the first ban against doctors and healthcare providers talking to patients. The story behind it's interesting. It was a pediatrician who was asked to all of his patients, do you own a gun? He had a family with a young child who was six months of age. He asked if there was a gun in the house, and I should say that Bright Futures does talk about basically talking about guns, essentially at every stage of development. Uh, the family said they didn't want to have the conversation. And at the end of the meeting with the family, he dismissed them from their practice. The family was upset, they mentioned to some people, it got higher and higher and higher, and eventually, Florida passed this law. Um, the law immediately had an injunction put against it, and then seven years later, it was actually completely removed. So, just to be very clear, there are no legal restrictions anywhere in the United States about talking to families about guns. There are no legal restrictions anywhere in the United States about documenting that conversation. You can tell the police if you are concerned. HIPAA allows us to do this uh, if you're concerned about their life or somebody else's. What you cannot do is you cannot discriminate against families, which is not an unreasonable thing, I think. It's very interesting. It's very similar to like the whole idea about vaccines and like what do you do with families who don't want to vaccinate their children? And there are practices that won't take care of those kids, and there are other practices that will. But you can't discriminate. What do I do? Um, I'm an ER doctor. I don't talk to everybody who comes in with an asthma attack and an earache about guns, but I do try to make it my business with everybody who comes in with a behavioral health problem, which, as we know, is a huge number right now. I talk to them. Uh, with the kids, it's pretty straightforward. I do it in the context of heads that home, education, activities, drug, depression, sex, suicide. And when I get to the suicide part, I just ask them, do you have a gun available to you? Would you know how to get a hold of one? And I'm just very straightforward. I'm sitting down. It's part of our conversation. And I just hear what they say. When I do the parents, I do it slightly different. First, I talk about pills, and I talk about the importance of getting a lockbox, and I talk about the Tylenol and the Motrin and everything in the house going into it. Very easy, they get it, they hear it. And then I ask them, is there a gun in the home? And regardless of what they say, yes or no, I say, here's the reason I'm asking. And I go through that conversation that if your child were to use the pills, they're almost guaranteed to survive because we know how to help them. But if they use that gun, it's almost guaranteed they're gonna die. Now, because I live in Massachusetts, I don't talk to a lot of families who have guns, or at least who are telling me about it, but about every month I hear from somebody who has one. And what's very interesting about the conversation is almost universally it's with the mom, and she says, I had not thought about that. And we assume that they want to think about this. We assume, and I believe, that people want their kids to be safe, but they hadn't thought about it. And I think that's one of the really important parts of having this conversation. This was a study, very simple way of looking at it. This is done through family practices. Having a loaded or unlocked gun in your house increases the risk of injury or death to family members, whether by accident or on purpose. I urge you to store your unloaded guns in a locked drawer or cabinet and out of reach of children. And when they did this study, and this was back in uh, 2002, the study was done, they found that this type of verbal counseling did make a difference in improved uh, storage. There are lots of ways to do this, and I'm not gonna go through all the details. There are cable locks, which gun owners aren't typically a big fan of. There are lock boxes, there are safes, but we need to talk about it. It's also important to talk about getting the guns out of the house. When I talk to those families whose kids are in the ER for depression and suicidality, I tell them, you can get them out of the house. They can be stored with a family friend who can store it safely. They can be stored at um, shooting ranges. A lot of gun stores will do that. The police will even take them in temporarily to hold them for you and think about getting it out of the house. There are a lot of good organizations if you're interested in joining. This is just some of them. But I'll conclude with this. So uh, my wife and I are both pediatric ER doctors who are Jewish, which what does that mean? It means I've worked Christmas for the last 23 years. <laughs> 2014, Christmas Day, this boy comes in. He's seven years old. He and his cousin were playing cops and robbers. They found a pellet gun. They didn't know it was loaded. His cousin shot him, it ricocheted off of his clavicle, broke a rib, and lodged in his pericardium. He survived, that, that pellet is still there. 
I think we need a five-pronged approach. We need improved and consistent legislation across our country. It is always, to me, the height of insanity that where you live makes such a huge difference with this and so many other things. We need to have consumer regulation. Not regulating guns for safety just makes no sense, and we can do much, much better. We need to collect data. It needs to be available. We need to fund research. And we have a role of screening and counseling our patients, ideally before they're hurt. So I want to thank you so much for having me. It's really been an honor to be here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I have goosebumps. Um, if you are attending by WebEx, feel free to type your questions in the chat. If you're in the room, you can raise your hand, and Dr. Fleegler will repeat your question for the audience in WebEx. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, so going back to your data, I, mean, I think the data by state and laws are really interesting. You know, the counter, which I think you addressed pretty well in your talk, but the counter is always like, well, states that have gun laws or states that have a culture that is more anti-gun. You know, we know, it, you know, in Washington and probably Massachusetts too, if you drive two hours east, you know, you're in some country that's very different, even though Washington is also a blue state. Have people looked at? Um, yeah, so, so the question is, um, there's a lot of diversity across states in terms of kind of um, uh, both the politics of the states, the rurality of it, and does that make a difference with regards to legislation and ownership and things like that? The, the, these are really important details, and to think of a state as monolithic is not accurate. The first challenge we have is we don't really have very good data about even estimates of gun ownership at county levels. Um, actually, the RAND Corporation is about to release um, what they have put together as kind of a map uh, at the county level, at the 3,000 counties, about what they think gun ownership is like. Um, legislation's probably first major role does affect gun ownership rates. How hard it is to own a gun has an effect on like gun ownerships. And you're absolutely correct that um, we, it's hard to tease apart what comes first. Is it the attitudes towards guns that then lead to l higher or lower rates of legislation, which then lead to higher or lower rates of ownership? Or is it the opposite? And, and it, to try to tease those apart is, is difficult. Um, but we know that even when you look across counties that are more rural, that may vote more Republican, in states where there's more legislation, the firearm fatality rates compared to the places that maybe have less legislation are far, far lower. So I do think it has an effect, whether it's the same effect as opposed to like the inner city par parts of areas, probably is different, but I do think it helps overall. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay. Thank you. We have time for a couple more. I have a few in the chat. Um, what do you think is the best approach if your children go over to someone else's home and asking those parents if they have guns in their home and how they are stored? Yeah. I've done this too. So, so, so there's a big movement. It's called Ask A S K about doing exactly that, which is encouraging parents to talk to people in other homes before their child goes over for a play date to ask, are there guns in the home, and be very specific about it. Um, there is absolutely no data about this in terms of its safety. I think it's a very reasonable approach. Um, I think if you're going to have those conversations, you have to recognize one, you literally have no idea what the answer is going to be. You may think you know but you do not know, and you need to be willing to kind of like say why this is important to you, and then come up with alternatives. Um, I, I think it's a good approach that should be considered uh, doing it, and I know a lot of my colleagues do exactly that. Okay, a few more. Um, how do you maintain hope when you keep on caring for kids being shot again and again, and the gun lobby is so strong? How do you maintain hope? Um, uh, it's, it's a good question. And uh, I think it's, it's a rather, it's, this is a depressing topic. I mean, just start, let's just be honest with it. Um, but I do think we can make a difference. Um, there have certainly been other countries that have dealt with severe gun violence effects that have taken very different approaches. This has happened in Australia. This has happened in New Zealand. This has happened in Switzerland and in Israel, where they've said, you know, our gun culture, which those are all four places that have fairly strong gun cultures, um, made significant changes. There are many people who think what happened in Australia and New Zealand, which is basically a, a, a major terrorist type of thing happened, there was a mass killing, and within weeks and months, they changed gun ownership laws and they recalled a lot of guns. A lot of people think that's not something that would be possible in our own country. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I think Israel is actually a very interesting example. So Israel recognized 
that they were having a suicide problem among their young military. And part of what was going on was that the military were encouraged to take guns home on the weekends because in Israel they were worried about literally shootings happening there and they wanted their military to kind of be there. Well, it turns out that's when the suicides were happening. And they'd made a decision, this is something we don't want to have happen. And they banned, they banned the military from bringing home guns on the weekend if they were not on active duty. They reduced the firearm suicide rate by like 30 or 40 percent. It's an enormous change that happened. And so I think there are possibilities, but we got to keep working on it. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Fliegler, for coming out from Boston to speak with us and for being here um, for our weekend conference as well. And thanks to all our participants in the room and on WebEx. Thank you. We'll see everybody next week. Thank you.